mm-hmm. question, I guess, is what is your view on the U.S.'s relationship with Iran right now, especially like during the Trump era? And where do you think it's going right now with current politics, with Joe Biden potentially taking office? And uh, where do you see us now and in the future? The history of U.S.-Iran relations is, is really a tragedy of, of lost opportunities and, and misunderstandings. To this day, I think Iranians and Americans see that history in completely different ways. They're like parallel train tracks. Our, our two interpretations just never coincide. So from the American standpoint, U.S.-Iran relations begin and end in 1980, 1979. So that was the period when uh, our Shah, who had been our faithful ally for 25 years and who we had installed on the Peacock throne, uh, was overthrown. And then our diplomats were taken hostage. This started a cycle of bitterness against Iran. And as far as we understood at the time, which was very little, uh, those Iranians who took our diplomats hostage were nothing but nihilistic savages who did this in violation of every law of God and man. We never stopped hating them for that. And since then, we have been almost without a break uh, in deep confrontation with Iran. This is odd because life in Iran is so much more like life in the United States than uh, in uh, many of our so-called allies. The society in Iran is very much like ours. Whereas the society in many of the countries in the Middle East that are our so-called allies, not like ours. Um, Iran also has uh, long-term strategic goals that are actually in many ways congruent with ours. Sunni extremism, which we claim to be fighting in the form of Al-Qaeda and ISIS, is the greatest enemy of Iran. Uh, those extremists that we're fighting, that we claim to have as enemies, are their greatest enemy. They want to kill all Shia. And Iran is the center of Shia Islam. So Iranians definitely have a, uh, a motivation to be intensely involved in the anti-terror struggle in the Middle East. So despite all of this, the emotion that comes from the overthrow of the Shah and the hostage crisis is still reverberating through our politics. And it has been fanned by our so-called friends in Saudi Arabia and Israel, who for their own reasons, are very focused on the idea of containing Iran. That's the way we see the relationship. But there's a completely different interpretation from the Iranian side. So the Iranians would tell you, yeah, there was the hostage crisis, that was unfortunate, but that was just a bump in the road. The real moment when everything went bad between the United States and Iran was in 1953. So this is an episode of which most Americans are ignorant. In in 1953, Iran was emerging as an incipient democracy. Because it was democratic, the government responded to the demands of the Iranian people, which were all focused on one issue, and that was oil. Iran is sitting on an ocean of oil. The oil was owned by one British company, which in turn was owned by the British government. At the same time, Iranians were living in some of the worst conditions of anybody in the world. It was only logical that when Iran finally moved into democracy in the period after the Second World War, the first thing a democratic government would want to do is take back control of the oil resource. And that's what it did. So Prime Minister Mossadegh, and uh, the Iranian parliament nationalized the Iranian oil resource. That set in motion a series of events that led the CIA and its British counterpart to overthrow Mossadegh in 1953. That wasn't just the overthrow of an individual. It was the end of democratic government in Iran. Uh, We reinstalled the Shah on his peacock throne uh, and he went on to rule with increasing repression for another 25 years. That repression produced the explosion of the late 1970s, what we call the Islamic Revolution. And that's what turned Iran into the country that it is today, 
being led by a clique of anti-American mullahs. It all started in 1953. This is the Iranian narrative. But in America, we don't recognize that we ever interfered and said everything wrong there. But the fact is this, if we had not intervened and overthrown Iran's democratic government in 1953, we might have had a functioning democracy in the heart of the Muslim Middle East all these 70 years. And I can hardly wrap my mind around how different the world and the Middle East might be if we had only decided to allow Iranian democracy to unfold rather than react to crush it as a way of protecting our access to oil. Now, I mean, recently, just I think this year, it was either late 19 or, or early 2020, Trump ordered the execution or had um, that general Solem Soleimani, I believe is how you say it. He was killed in a drone strike. What, what is your view on that? And what, what do you think his, his reasoning for that or his competence of the whole situation was? Again, there's such a different narrative from the Iranian side and from the American side. So, the American narrative is Iran is a hegemonic power. It's trying to extend its tentacles all around the Middle East. It sponsors militias and political groups and gives them money and weapons. Soleimani, the general who was the head of the Revolutionary Guards, was seen as the person who was the uh, diabolical master of this network with all its Middle Eastern tentacles, and therefore a kind of terrorist mastermind. Uh, in the Middle East terms, anybody is a terrorist who opposes the interests of the United States, particularly with any violence. So um, when you are uh, militantly or violently resisting American power in the Middle East, that, that's what defines a terrorist uh, in our view. So he became something like the chief terrorist uh, now, look at it differently from the Iranian side. So Iran uh, is the center of Shia Islam. Shia Islam is the number one enemy of radical Sunni movements like Al-Qaeda and now ISIS. Those groups have, as I said earlier, their principal goal is to kill all Shia. They want to come in Iran and essentially kill everyone in Iran. They, that's who their real enemy is. They hate the Shia more than they hate the Christians or Jews or anyone else. Um, naturally makes Iran eager to fight those groups. And Mr. General Soleimani was definitely the greatest ISIS killer of all time. We have been even allied with Al Qaeda and its uh, brother groups in places like Syria, but Iran never did that for reasons of self-preservation. The other piece of the Soleimani and Iranian influence story is this. Iran is, the, as I said, the world center of Shia Islam, but there are pockets of Shia, Shiism all over the Middle East and beyond. Uh, in many places, those people are the oppressed. If you go to a Muslim city there, a Middle East city, let's say like Beirut, you'll find essentially the poor neighborhoods, those are the Shia neighborhoods. Uh, and social services are very uh, weak in, from the government there. That's why groups uh, like Hezbollah have grown up. They provide the whole network of social services that keep Shia communities alive. If a widow can't survive with her kids, the government has no programs for those people, but you can go to the Hezbollah office and they will help you. It's a kind of a government, a shadow government. Those are Shia organizations and they're sponsored by Iran. Those organizations also have military wings as like Hezbollah. So Iran is thinking, we are just supporting oppressed and persecuted Shia communities all over the Middle East. It's not that we're trying to expand influence, it's we're trying to protect our own people. And so uh, again, the narratives are so different um, I was quite taken aback by the decision to kill uh, Soleimani um, 
it certainly was something that bound Iranians together again. Uh, everybody in Iran, I think, admired him for, for what he had done. Uh, so it was definitely a symbol, if one was needed, as to how intensely the anti-Iran hatred is still. Now, a lot of the narrative from Trump's team and Trump was that Soleimani was responsible for the deaths of tons and tons of U.S. soldiers, not tons, but lots of U.S. soldiers, um, and attacks on U.S. bases over there. Are you... Soleimani was supporting militia groups right. uh, in, in Iraq. Um, and those militia groups were devoted to pushing the United States out of Iraq. Mm. Don't forget that Iraq is also a majority Shia country. Uh, most of the leaders of Iraq are people who, during the Saddam, go to live in Iran because they were Shia, they couldn't survive under. So these are with very deep ties to Iran. There's a very strong tie between Iran and Iraq that has to do with the Shia majorities in both countries. So yes, uh, Iran was supporting militias that were attacking American soldiers in Iraq. And their answer would be, well, you shouldn't be here. That's why we attacked you. We attacked invaders in our part of the world. But of course, from the point of view of the United States, anybody who attacks American soldiers is a terrorist. And if Soleimani was even indirectly connected to those attacks, that could have put him high on our death list. Mm -hmm.